Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Let us pray. Lord God, Heavenly Father, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be pleasing to you, our rock and our redeemer. In the name of Jesus, amen. <clears throat> so, did you hear the lessons for today? Did you hear those? Did you really listen to them? There's a difference between hearing and listening sometimes, isn't there? Because if you really listen to those lessons for today, there was a lot of hardship and struggle and trial, tribulation, and gunk in there. That's the reality of, of life. And, and those lessons we heard today reminds us of the reality of life. Here in the Old Testament lesson, we have the prophet and the people of God crying out to God for freedom and deliverance. They were suffering. They were in pain. They just wanted to be rescued. They wanted to be back in God's good graces. Even though they were there in the first place, they didn't realize it. They're the ones who plucked themselves out of God's hands, like we often do in our lives. But they were still crying for God to deliver them, to free them, to rescue them, to restore them. And there was Paul, sitting in chains in jail for the sake of the gospel, writing his lesson. And even though Paul made the best of it, I don't assume jail is the most fun place to be. He had his trials of his own. And then there's that gospel lesson for the day where Jesus is reminding us that temptation will come into this world and reminding us of the very real and sudden and certain consequences to our bad choices and our sin. None of us like to hear about that. I mean, I could preach a whole sermon about that, but then half the congregation would be mad and not come back. So I'm not going to do that. Because none of us like to hear about that. But Jesus is reminding us flat out, hey, if you're going to cause somebody to sin, it's much better for you to have a millstone tied around your neck and thrown in the creek. There are very real consequences to our sins and our bad choices in life. And as we look at these lessons, we realize life is hard. And you're saying, no, duh, pastor, I know that. But it's very hard. Just this week, just this week, the Missouri Synod was touched by tragedy. A pastor in Fort Dodge, Iowa, who had been in the ministry for many years. He was 64 years old, I believe. He was a chaplain for every agency in his town. In Fort Dodge, Iowa. Have any of you been to Fort Dodge, Iowa, by the way? It's not a metropolis by any means, okay? So it's a very quaint little town. Walked out of his church at 5 in the evening while there were Bible studies and all kinds of activities going on. Was confronted by a robber who killed him on the spot. This, after about 10 years ago, a little, maybe 20 years ago, the congregation suffered an arsonist burning down their building and had to rebuild through that. Life is hard. It's very hard. Last night, if you watch the news, there was another mass shooting in Kansas City, of all places, at a bar. Nine people wounded so far, four dead. Here's the reality of what happens in our world. It's a very hard place to live in. Life is not easy. And we may think, as we see that on the news, well, yeah, that isn't happening to me. But I guarantee you, if you sit here and think about your own lives, you have your struggles. You have your hardships. You have your problems. Whether it be financial or marital problems, or issues with your family or children, whether they're adults or young children, whether it be an illness or mental illness, you have your own issues and problems, your own sets of struggles that you go through each and every day of your lives. And that even may be your job or your co-workers. I don't know. It may be that you run out of coffee one morning. That's a pretty bad thing to happen to you. At my house, that would be very dangerous. You see, life is hard. And God tells us in his word to be prepared for this hard world. So let me ask you, how in the world are we to be prepared to live in this world where everything's so hard, where it isn't perfect, where it's filled with temptation and sin and trials and tribulation? How are we to be prepared? What do we do? Any ideas? Pray. That's always a good one right there. Yeah, what else? Come to church. That's why you're here today, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right? What else? Word of God? Yeah, that's good too. God's Word. It's living and active, right? Because what do we believe about Jesus? He is the Word that became flesh and made His dwelling among us. We're going to talk more about that as we go on in our message today. What else? Oh yeah, great. The Lord's Supper. Where did you come up with that? Great answer. Great. 
great answer, great answer. So in all of these ways, we stay prepared. But God also calls us to be prepared by being vigilant, being alert to what's around us, right? And part of being vigilant and being alert to what's around us is being ready to love the world that is in chaos around us. Hold on, stop it for a second. Yeah, right. What do you mean? We saw a good example of that this week on the news too, didn't we? When Botham Jean's family went and embraced and forgave his murderer on live public television, the judge went to her chambers and came back from her chambers, hugged her and gave her a Bible and said to her, start reading at John 3.16. This will serve you well. <laughs> That's pretty awesome, isn't it? And it's been all over the news. Embracing the world with love, even in hardships and trials. You know, daily we face these battles and struggles and sometimes we do fall into sin. At least I do. I can't speak for you, but I know I fall into sin. And sometimes in the middle of the trials, and I don't explain this either, we stand upright and they don't affect us at all. Isn't that kind of weird? Sometimes we fall, sometimes we stand upright. I'm sure you've experienced that. There have been trials that have come into my life and I'm like, this will be the end of me. And the next thing I know, I'm on the other side. I'm like, wow, that was pretty easy to get through. And then something small comes into my life and I fall on the ground and crumble like melted ice cream crying in the fetal position. I wonder, this isn't that big of a deal. Why am I on the ground in the fetal position crying? But that's just kind of how life hits us. It depends on our mental state. It depends on our emotional state. It depends on what we're going through at any given circumstance in our life. But the reality is it affects us all differently. You and I can go through the very same circumstance. You may stand upright. I may fall. And that's where we need each other. And that's where we talk about love, which we'll focus on in just a second. The reality is in this world, we're going to have struggles, temptation, and sin. There is no way of getting around it. You can do anything you can to try to get around it, but I promise you, you will have troubles. You will have sin, and you will have temptation. Now let's talk a little bit about temptation. Jesus said temptation will come into your life. We need to remember this, because sometimes as Christians, we mess this up. Temptation is not sin. If it were sin... Then Jesus sinned. Because you remember those 40 days Jesus spent in the wilderness? What was happening to him? He was being tempted. Temptation is just temptation. It comes into our life and yes, it can be very hard and yes, it can be overwhelming. And a lot of times God allows that temptation into our life because it does something very crucial in our lives. It turns us back to him. It strengthens our faith. It causes us to stand up and take note of who we are in light of God and His promises and His forgiveness and His Holy Spirit in our lives. Temptation isn't a bad thing. We shouldn't fear it. Because we have God and His holy angels to protect us. And we can turn to Him anytime. And He promises to be there and to lift us up out of that temptation. The struggles and hardships we talk about. We kind of talked about those. They come into life. Let me say this about that. You know, if you were to hook up, you know, have any of you ever seen a heart monitor in a hospital? It kind of goes like this, right? Right? Okay. So, you know, you kind of hook up life, you know, for the unbeliever. You know, let's look at them for a minute. You hook up their life and it's like this. And then all of a sudden they come to faith. Jesus says, what about that? Jesus says, when I come into your life, I come to give you life but more abundantly. So all of a sudden life is like this and Jesus enters. Now it's like this, Right? right? It's like, great, thanks Jesus. I really needed more abundant life. What are you talking about? Why do I need that? Thanks. And then he goes on to say, and in this world, by the way, you're going to have troubles. But take heart, I've come to give you peace. <laughs> it's not the best advertisement for Christianity. People aren't lining up at our doors to become Christians. The reality is, the reason we have more troubles and trials and tribulations is because when we come to faith in Christ, a big target is put on our back and Satan says, I'm going to bring you down. And that's where we go closer to Jesus. That's where we grow closer to each other in love, which we'll talk about in a little bit. Because as we do, the trials and the struggles will come, but we will be able to withstand. And oh, sin, 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 sin. Boy. I mean, we could preach multiple sermons on sin. Uh, every Sunday we preach, we talk about sin, don't we, in fact? Because by our very nature, we are what? Sinful and unclean. 
That's what we confess sometimes in our, one of our confessions, right? We are by our very nature sinners. It's in our DNA. It's in our structure. We are born and conceived in sin, Scripture tells us. We can't get rid of it. There's nothing we can do. It clings to us like a dead body. But thanks be to God in Christ Jesus through his death and resurrection who has given us victory over sin, death, and the devil. And this is what that means. Is even though we sin, Jesus says if a person sins seven times in one day and they repent seven times in one day, they are forgiven. Well, that applies to you and to me. His repentance is there, not as a cheap grace. He's not saying, go out and do your sins knowing you can come back and ask for forgiveness. If it were that way, we'd all be having a lot more fun and wouldn't have to come to church, right? But don't do that because it works me out of a job. I need that. That's not what Jesus is saying. Because Jesus knows the heart. You can't fool him, right? What he's saying is, my forgiveness is abundant. It's unconditional. It's never ending. And I know your heart. You will fall into sin because you are sinful by nature. But in my death and resurrection, I've taken care of that once and for all. In my death and resurrection, I have taken your sinfulness away and given you my righteousness. In my death and resurrection, when God sees you, he sees you as perfect and redeemed, holy, loved. He sees you as his dear child. And there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Brothers and sisters, the church gets this wrong so much. You need to understand that every moment of every day you live in the abundant grace of God and because of that there is now no condemnation on you. Shame and guilt have no place in your life because Jesus Christ in rising from the tomb has lifted you above that into the glorious realms of the sainthood in heaven. He has lifted your souls from the pit. He has answered the prayer of Habakkuk. Come and rescue me and save me. The righteous will live by faith, he says. The faith that he has given us in his death and resurrection and we will be declared righteous for eternity. Sin no longer has mastery over us. When we sin and fall, we repent, we get back up, we clean ourselves off and we cling to Jesus even harder. So many churches, so many Christians today, they sin and they go into wallowing and they go into mourning and they believe that their lives cannot be changed and shame enters their life because shame is the weapon of Satan and they begin to think, woe is me, I'm not a good child of God, I'm not a good parent, I'm not a good this, I'm not a good this. And that is a lie, a bold-faced lie from Satan because God has destroyed sin, death, and the devil. And so when sin comes... By the way, we're big sinners and we have a big Savior. Cling to that Savior because you're already forgiven. All of this hardship in life happens for one intent purpose. Leading us back to God over and over and over again. Parents, how many times have you had to tell your children not to do something? I remember as a little kid, my grandma had one of those, those old time coffee pots that's what I call them now since Keurigs are out remember you put the pot on and the pot plate right and I would always want to run towards it and put my hand on it I don't know why but I did and they would always say no don't do that no don't do that well one day nobody saw me and I did and I got burnt and I realized the consequences and I turned to grandma and grandma could have said well I told you so she didn't. She loved me and took care of me. And that's what God does too. All of the hardship and trials and temptations of life come for one reason. So that we may keep our eyes focused on Jesus as Lord and Savior. So that he may fix our brokenness, mend our wounds, wipe our sins away, and set us back on a path of peace and righteousness over and over again in his abundant love. Never really thought of sin that way, did you? Blessings come in mysterious places. But there is great news in this. Jesus is with us. Let's look at this image. I found this on Facebook. I thought this was quite interesting. It says, remember Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. God didn't put out the fire. He just put Jesus in there with him. It's not about God putting out our fires in life. It's about who's in the fire with us. Brothers and sisters, God never promised to, to, to stop your trials and tribulations. But he did promise to jump in with you. 
And when he jumps in with you, he promises the fire will not hurt you because he's there to protect you. He's there to strengthen you. He's there to walk through it with you so that when you come out of the fire on the other side, you may give witness to everyone around you that God has saved you, just like these three guys did. Did you ever think about that? And the world stands in utter amazement when Christians come out of hardships and trials, mourning and loss and struggles, and we come out on the other side praising God in the storm with our eyes lifted towards heaven, saying, Alleluia, you are a marvelous God. They marvel at what we have because they don't understand it. But we do. Because even in the midst of the fire, Jesus is with us and his peace passes all understanding. When Jesus is in our fire, it loses its complete and total ability to destroy us. We have been given the blessed gift of fellowship and love. Let's look at the next slide. When someone is broken, don't try to fix them because you can't. When someone is hurting, don't attempt to take away their pain because you can't. Instead, love them by walking beside them in their hurt because you can. Sometimes what people need is simply to know they aren't alone. You remember the theology of the cross? That vertical realm is our relationship with God. The horizontal realm is our relationship with each other. Remember what St. Paul talked about in our lesson for today? Fan into flames the gift that God has given you by his Holy Spirit. This is what he's talking about, my brothers and sisters, because the tangible, physical body of Jesus Christ is here in the sacrament, but it's also here in you and me as Jesus is alive in us. We are his temple. He has made his dwelling amongst us and in us. And when people are going through trials and tribulations, where they're going through the hardships of life, the reality is that's when we walk with each other hand in hand with his overwhelming love, not trying to take, fix them, not trying to take away the pain, but mourning with them, empathizing with them, crying with them, and laughing with them, and letting them know, most importantly, they are not alone. Because sometimes we are the ones in the fire with them as Jesus works through us to love them, to care for them, to bring them peace and comfort and joy and salvation. And not just us in here, but everybody you meet out there too. Because I guarantee you there are people at your workplaces, your schools, amongst your neighbors and your friends who are in the torment of hellfire right now. And all they need is somebody to jump in with the loving presence of Jesus and say, I'm here with you. I am here with you. In the name of Jesus, Amen.